Welcome to Capital Preview, a weekly bipartisan discussion with Iowa legislators about the key issues facing our state. Brought to you by Mediacom. Welcome to another edition of Capital Preview. My name is Bill Peard. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Iowa Cable and Telecommunications Association. This show, Capital Preview, is designed to educate our uh, public on uh, things important to them going on at the Capitol. Um, our guest this morning is Senator Charles Snyder, Republican from District 22 in West Des Moines. And I appreciate you coming in here this morning, Senator. I know you're a busy man. Happy to be here. Um, so um, I'm gonna, it, this is just kind of a conversational show. We just we'll kind of pick up, there's some important things that I kind of want to know about what you, what's going on and you feel free to uh, throw in whatever you need to okay. that you think will help benefit our viewers. So, th so the first um, question, probably the most important question, because budget is your number one mm -hmm. thing that you have to get done, right? And right. It has to balance. Um, mm -hmm. So, so what is the status? What is the status of the budget negotiations as it sits right now? Well, right now we're we're through the process of a lot of policy making, so we're down to the budget. The revenue estimating conference met in March and their estimate for revenue was uh, higher than what it had been in December, so by law we used the December estimate. So now that we know those numbers, we've been working closely with the House to try and identify what the budget targets will be. I chair the Appropriations Committee in the Senate, uh, Representative Pat Grassley chairs the House Appropriations Committee, and the two of us have been talking. We're pretty close on where we think we need to be in order to uh, satisfy the state's needs mm -hmm. and uh, incorporate some of the spending bills that we've already passed this year, such as the $50 million that we'll be putting toward K-12 education. So just out of curiosity, um, the the uh, legislature officially adjourns, I think, is it the end of next week? Um, uh, April 17th is the day that okay. the last per diem payment okay. is uh, going to be issued to okay. people and generally the General Assembly tries to adjourn by that date. Do you think you're on track for that? Because I know this budget has to get worked out. Yeah, we may push it beyond that. We may have to at this point. Uh -huh. um, the 17th is just eight days away. Yeah. And uh, well, a little more than eight days away. I guess about, well, yeah, eight days away yeah. from, from now. And it, it takes a certain amount of time just to print bills, pass them, send them over to the other chamber, and have them approved by that chamber. Yeah. So it's probably going to be extended past the 17th. Okay. Um, what's the status of the tax reform? I know that's been another big item or issue this year for yeah. tax reform, tax reduction. Right. Um, we're also getting close to an agreement on that as well. Uh, the governor put forward a plan early in, early in the session and laid out a marker that she wanted to get uh, personal income tax reform and relief passed this year. Uh, we in the Senate passed our own plan a couple of months ago and the House is evaluating both of those plans right now. Uh, we're hoping to see their plan soon so that we can uh, begin the process of coming to an agreement. Hmm. Um, and I know, so and maybe I miss it. So do you think you're more likely to pass the Senate's version of the tax reform or the governor's? Um, um, it won't be the exact same version that we passed out. Uh, that was a very aggressive bill. Right, um, it I, was. What we, will, yeah, what we will pass is something that I hope includes personal income tax relief, corporate income tax relief and reform, and also simplification. Those were the three key pieces of the bill that we passed. And uh, we passed an aggressive bill because we just wanted to drive home the point that each of those three elements is, is critical. Mm -hmm. And there are really two main reasons why we need tax reform done this year. One of them is because we're not competitive when it comes to our tax system as a state. We rank 40th out of the 50 states according to the Tax Foundation. And uh, we're just simply not competitive. We have the second highest corporate income tax rate, the fifth highest personal income tax rate, and uh, we need to be more competitive than that if we want to succeed. Yeah. And then the second important reason is that because of federal deductibility, Iowans will be, will be paying more Iowa income tax this year than uh, they have in the past. Yeah. So it's important that we, we send that money or let uh, taxpayers keep that money rather than just simply absorb it into state government. Yeah. Makes sense. 
Um, why is it so important to get tax reform done in this session? Yeah, those are the two main reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. competitiveness yeah. and the fact that if we don't do anything right now, Iowans are going to be paying more income tax, more Iowa income tax than they have in the past. Um, you were recently elected president of the Senate. What does that entail? I know that must feel like a haystack <laughs> fell on you a little bit. But a little bit, yeah. yeah. It's busy. Yeah. Um, what you do as president is you're sitting up in the dais and you're conducting the meeting. It's, uh, you're the presiding officer, so you gavel the chamber in. Um, you have to uh, lead, the de lead the debate, announce when bills are, are being called up, recognize senators to speak on them. And if, if people are, are uh, calling for a, a point of order, then you've got to address that. That's happened a couple times already since <laughs> since I got into the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, but you also have a lot of meetings throughout the day. You meet with constituents, you meet with uh, interest groups, uh, and last week I even had the chance to meet with a consul general from the Chicago office uh, from Japan. And that was a great meeting too. So it, it's a lot of fun. I'm now, enjoying now it the, so the far. The consul general is the head of the Council. Yeah, well, the so there in are several Japan, different, yeah, there are different consulates. In Chicago, right. Right, there are different consulates yeah. for, um, that Japan has throughout the country. They've got one consulate in Chicago, and uh, the consul general I met heads up that Chicago office. Very cool. That would be cool. Um, you know, and I, I know that, and, and being down there, I know the, the, the president and the, and the majority leader of the either party is is a I mean you basically run kind of the the work the workings down there correct it's yeah it, the workload is split the um, what what I do is the president is part of what I do is I decide which bills get assigned to which committees um, the Senate majority leader on the other hand decides what bills are actually going to be called up for debate Got it. and okay. uh, the Senate Majority Leader also appoints people to serve as chairs of different policy committees. Uh, he or she assigns people to be members of those different committees. So their work is more political and more uh, uh, caucus oriented and, and mine is to a certain degree but it's more uh, statesmanlike as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, well you're doing a good job and I, I know you probably that was probably the last thing on your mind when you <laughs> entered the uh, legislature this uh, winter yeah. that you'd end up being the president of yeah. that. I certainly didn't see that coming. Yeah. No. Um, the mental health bill that uh, was passed uh, and that the governor signed was a big deal. Uh, what are some of the details about that plan? Yeah, this I think is a really great plan and a really good start for Iowa to start to improve on mental health delivery. The bill does a couple of important things. One is it sets up six uh, kind of emergency centers or triage centers throughout the state. And um, you might recall that we have a regional approach to delivery of mental health care in Iowa right now. And those regions will pay for those different centers. And it's a place where people can go if, if, they're, if they find themselves having some kind of mental health crisis Law enforcement can take them there. They'll be treated by uh, a professional, healthcare professional, mental health care professional, and that person will help determine whether or not that person needs critical care or subacute care or needs to be placed in some kind of residential uh, type facility. And uh, that's a big improvement over what we have now. Right now, people just end up going to jail and mm -hmm. staying there for who knows how long until we're able to find a bed. And the second important thing that it does is it, it beefs up our subacute level of care. Um, and that's one area where we really are lacking as a state right now. Uh, we, we have beds for critical care. We have a lot of residential type facilities, community-based facilities throughout the state. But we don't have um, a lot of uh, beds for subacute care. We, the bill lifts a, um, a, a maximum number of beds that currently is in state law and opens that up so that we can provide more, more beds for that level of care. Um, well, I know it was a big deal and I, I think both sides were proud of that. I was at the bill signing, I think it was last week, yeah. and it, that rotunda was full and mm -hmm. that's not, uh, <clears throat> that's kind of unusual at a bill signing that you get that many people in yeah. 
that big an area. So yeah, that's a real testament to the yeah, popularity of the bill. Absolutely. A, a lot of the interest groups that are mm -hmm. interested in, in mental health care in Iowa came together to support this and help put the bill together. Law enforcement came together and helped. And uh, it, was a, it was a really good day for Iowa. Um, the <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> that's okay. Uh, um, we, uh, I got a, another question about, I'm just gonna go off the um, record here a little bit and talk mm -hmm. about a couple of things and get your opinion of them. Um, one of the things that are happening now is we've got a new data center um, in our metro area. Mm -hmm. And I know they're, they're working out um, language for new language for the data center and the, and the tax incentives that it's given. So. Can you kind of, because I mean, that's an important thing. We're getting more and more uh, data centers in mm -hmm. the metro area. So can you kind of give me your take on that a little bit? So I, I, if, um, so I think what you're referring to is um, a provision that was in the Senate tax bill that would have said that data centers wouldn't be able to qualify for the high quality jobs tax credit. Correct. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And that's still a work in progress. Um, any data center like the Apple data center in, in Waukee, I think ought to be grandfathered in. Um, you know, they based their decision to come here on what the law was at the time, and it would be unfair for us to change the rules of the game after they've already made a commitment to come here. Mm -hmm. um, but when you look at a lot of the data centers, they haven't really utilized that high quality jobs tax credit. Right. Most of them, like Microsoft and West Des Moines, which I've got the most experience with, um, have utilized uh, TIF districts to help get themselves established and build infrastructure out to their facilities. Well, and, and one reason that um, I have so much respect for you is, um, one, um, you're a very bright guy, but two, you were a council person at a local level, so you know what the, it all starts locally, yeah. um, which I think helps you a lot, in my opinion. Up, I appreciate that. Up in the Senate, uh, because you understand what they have to do out in the field, and they're doing that on behalf of the citizens. So mm -hmm. um, I appreciate that you have some um, knowledge in that too. So, well, thank you. Um, the other thing is, and I'm just going to hit you with both barrels. Uh, the other thing is TIF. Um, I know there's a there's a TIF bill floating around. I don't think it's in the Senate. No, I think it's in the House. Yes. Um, but you probably know a little bit about TIF, and you can just kind of give me a quick summary of how you how effective you think TIF is and its tax increment financing. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's it's very effective when it's used well. And the cities that use it well use it to help build out new infrastructure like we did in, in West Des Moines and like you've done in Waukee. And when you do that, basically what you're doing is you're using new property tax revenue mm -hmm. to build out infrastructure. And if you didn't have that increment to use for that, then it would have to be spread out among all current taxpayers in the city by increasing the property tax levy. Mm -hmm. So using a, a TIF dis district is, I think, a better, more responsible, more equi equitable way to do that without mm -hmm. having to raise property taxes. Okay, very good. Well, it looks like our time uh, is up, Senator. I appreciate you coming in here and, and uh, having a chat with us on what's going on. I think you guys have, in my opinion, I think you guys have done a lot of good work this year and and hopefully um, your good work will be rewarded by letting you guys go on a timely <laughs> basis but um, so I appreciate very much Senator Charles Snyder uh, coming in here and chatting with us this morning it's been my pleasure thank you for having me thank you for tuning in and uh, please join us for another edition of capital preview <laughs>